Well, hi and welcome to my beautiful office, talking about the R5C with my experience with it so far. I have uh, had it for four weeks. I've done a hell of a lot of filming in that time and photographing. We're going to talk about my opinion on the filming side of it today. My likes, dislikes, the quirks, uh, yeah, all the little nitty gritty things about it that I've found so far. I've got it set up reasonably well now, but yeah, I certainly haven't mastered it. But let's make something clear right now. You have to go in with your eyes wide open, buying this camera for wildlife. It's a cinema camera. It's not designed for speed. It's not designed for wildlife. It's designed for filming people and doing all those sort of things that you do with film. So we have to slow our mind down. We have to make sure that everything is right with the camera. It is not run and gun. I come from a camcord background. Camcords are awesome. Everything is built in. You can use it, them to a fair degree with handheld work without it being too shaky. So they're awesome for in the forest environment. But for me, they've never had the image quality or been able to work in very dull lighting conditions like I'm in now. Like this camera can, it can work in all sorts of lighting conditions. But what we're going to do now is look at my setup for filming wildlife. This is how I carry the camera around with me. On a tripod. 99.5% of the time it's going to be on a tripod. We're filming wildlife. We need it to be steady. I can't handhold this, which we'll talk about later on. So this is the way I walk around with it when I'm moving from one place to the other so that I can be fairly quick to get going. When you're filming wildlife, things happen like that in front of you. You're going to miss out on a hell of a lot with this camera. And I understand that. So we have to configure all the buttons and everything to get it so that it works fairly quickly for us. We have to have everything attached to the tripod and to the camera ready for action. This is my Sennheiser shotgun microphone. It's very powerful. It can pick up those sounds of my subject from quite a distance, they say three, four meters away. This is fantastic. The other way that I'm capturing sound, when I don't need to be capturing the sounds of my subject, it's quiet and it's, you're not going to hear anything anyway. So I'll go for the lightweight little road microphone, but it's great for hiking, keeping it in your bag. I can't remember how many grams it is, but it's quite light. So it's awesome for that, it has really, really a reasonable enough sound. Now the one thing that's a killer for everybody else with this camera not buying it is the battery life. Because it has a fan, because it's so powerful a, a video camera, it chews the living daylights out of those batteries. So for 4K 8-bit, so the lowest uh, quality that you're going to is on the camera, you'll get about 30 minutes of battery life and that's a realistic thing, th about 30 minutes. For wildlife, that's no good. I often leave the camera on for an hour and a half because I'm expecting my subject to come back. My passion is antichinus. I study them, I photograph them, I film them. So I know the little ins and outs of what time I can expect him to come back to the nest and what times they might come out of the nest, but animals will be animals. They don't always stick to their time schedules. So they could be an hour before, they could be an hour later. So leaving the camera on just helps me to capture that moment when they suddenly pop up and there they are. We are all ready to go. It's vital <laughs> that we're not worrying about a battery. Now one of my viewers commented that he hired this camera uh, to really see whether it would work for him. And he was bitterly disappointed with the battery life. So I told him that if he listens to this review, he might change his mind. I'm, I don't want to particularly influence him on buying the camera. 
I just want to let him know and the rest of you know that really don't be bothered about batteries. There are two options really. There is a third and that's a battery grip. I think it's a waste of time for me personally. Two batteries, 60 minutes, that ain't gonna work very well. Or having lots of batteries in your bag. I just think it's an absolute waste of money. Right, it is good to have a backup battery though because I have a power bank in my hand here that's meant to power and run laptops. I forgot the cord once, <laughs> uh, left it at home. So it would have been nice to have a spare battery there. I don't have one at the minute and I will have to get one. But this is an absolute must. So you have power banks and you have the cinema range of V-mount batteries. This is 680 grams, I think from memory. So it's fairly light. And the test that one person had done online, he'd had the camera running for five hours and got sick of it in the end and didn't bother going any further. It's what happens out in the field that matters to me. So how has it gone for me? <laughs> well, I can tell you that it's been fantastic. It's taken the, it, even the thought away about battery life. I can leave my camera on for two hours, three hours if I want, waiting for my subject to turn up, and it's not an issue. So, battery turns up. I shoot up to Winter Wetlands, my favorite place to go to film the yellow-footed antichinus and study it. So how it works for me is, uh, I'm there for two solid days normally. I'll do a three to four hour stint in the morning, have a short lunch break, and then walk around photographing other birds and bits and pieces like that for my YouTube uh, videos uh, for an hour or so. Then I'll do another four or even five hour session in the afternoon. So two days like that. And now this battery has little indicator lights to tell you how much charge is left. There's 10 lights. After that whole two days of using the camera, like, because I'm still trying to get used to it, I'm constantly turning the camera on because I'm thinking about, oh, where's that in the menu? I need to remember where that is and uh, can I tweak and do things? So I'm constantly playing with the camera, turning it on every couple of minutes. I'm thinking, oh, have a look at that as well. Plus, waiting for my subject. The end result was I'd only used four lights on the battery. So I think we can safely say that using it the way that I, without the tweaking, take that out of it, we could get four days completely, confidently, say four days. I did uh, go back just recently, so a couple of days ago for a similar stint. Now I did a, do a similar amount of times for those two days, but I used up more batteries because my subject, the yellow-footed antichinus, the Joey's Rat and Nest, I did a hell of a lot of filming. I got a lot of good stuff and bad stuff, but I was filming subtly all the time. I also did a uh, bit of a talk to the camera to finish up my YouTube video with the R5C. And I did a lot of stuffing up. I did eight long takes. <laughs> so I had the camera running for up to seven minutes or 10 minutes uh, redoing and then turning, uh, stop recording and then record again. Uh, it took a long time for me to get it to where I was reasonably happy. If we're going to be real intense with a lot of filming and the odd bit of photographing as well, then we will have three solid days of that. So that's just awesome. There you go. That is the battery solution. Now for mounting it. For me, it was simple. I'm very inventive uh, and very uh, good with my hands. So I can easily make things. So just give me a second and I'll have the problem solved on how to hold this onto the tripod so it stays there and isn't a drama as you're walking along from one, going from one place to the other and then setting it up. 
So what I do is I uh, put it into the bag to stop it from being scratched. If it starts to drizzle, I've got time to pull it out before it gets into the terminals because it just sort of shields it a little bit. You know, it is uh, perforated, but it's enough to stop drips of rain getting inside just for those few moments that we need to be able to unpack it. So what I've done is with the carriage making it, the 25 mil strip of aluminium, about three millimetres thick, and I've got a piece of wood that was the same thickness as the battery and I've uh, shaped it, so bent it into shape. Then I've pot riveted the two pieces together so that it's nice and solid. Then I've got some felt and, and silicon that inside. As far as the cable goes, connecting it to the camera and the battery, I like to put that little device that Canon gives us, that little bracket, to make sure that just say I fall over, that it's not going to snap it. So to help in that department, yeah, I've definitely always attached that. So if I see something beside me and I want to be really quick and be efficient at getting it, the camera off the tripod to photograph something, that's pretty quick to unscrew, unplug that, uh, especially if I've got this microphone on, I'm not, uh, worrying about pulling that out I can just leave it I'll just waffle on a little bit longer about batteries I've bought another one it's on order and that is a 20,000 milliamp hour battery that's half the weight of this one so if I can get on say a three-day hike one charge out of that and two charges to three out of my phone and one or two with the Osmo Action camera will be plenty. Now, the biggest reason I'm buying that battery is I am going on the overland track in Tasmania. So that's from Cradle Mountain all the way down to getting close to Hobart, which is Lake St. Clair. So it's a six day hike. So I think that battery should help me out. Well, next on the list is focusing. <laughs> we have the whole screen. Then we have the large area fo focus square. Then we have a small focus square. But it is not a square. It's a bloody oblong. Canon. It's friggin' useless for me in a forest environment. Too many distractions. We need a focus point that's small enough to just be with inside our subject, not well beyond it. But a horizontal oblong for a small square you find that on the XF400 that I own, the XF605s that I just got rid of, had for about two seconds, it's useless on them. The, the width is almost perfect. It could have done with being a little bit smaller, but if they had made it the same height, we would have had a usable focus square. So what I have settled on is the whole area. Focus is the best for me because it has a lot of flexibility. So I've activated the center square, so I know exactly where cent the center is, and it has worked fairly well under some conditions. But it also has finger activated tracking. So we can just tap on a subject and the focus tracking will stick on it like glue and it works really well. So that is really versatile, but we can't always use that. So manual focusing is the next. But in that mode, that whole focus area, all I have to do is hit the AF lock button on the side here. And that virtually gives us manual focusing. So that's what I've been using. It just makes life quick and efficient. Focus peaking on any camera that I've had, it's always tricky to get it perfect. Every now and then, you get into a condition where the focus peaking really helps a lot. But in the majority of cases, it's frustrating to see whether it, it's perfect because it's lighting everything up. It's lighting things in the background and your subject and in the foreground. Uh, zooming in is the best help. And this um, has uh, a good tool in there. So we just hit the magnify button on the back there 
And if we want to go in a bit further, we hit the set button. That helps us get right in close. But once you start zooming in, the quality of the image drops off. So again, it makes it a little tough. I have a monitor on order. I've had it on order for what, five weeks now? And there's still no sign of it. Uh, they're still waiting on a back order. Now there's an issue with the camera and it, it's been talked about a lot on uh, YouTube, Facebook, all those sort of things. And that is turning the camera from photographing over to filming or vice versa. I haven't timed it, I don't see it necessary. I know it's quite a delay. One guy said it was eight seconds. But what I have found that works good for me is I just simply go to the off section first. Slight delay, couple of seconds, then go over to the other one that I'm wanting to do, filming or photographing. And all those little quirks disappear. It's something to keep in mind if you own this camera, don't go flicking from one to the other. It takes too long, it causes dramas, little glitches. So simply turn it off, then on again. And with the picture styles, I use wide dynamic range on the XF400 and when I had the XF605 and now on the Canon R5C. It works brilliantly. It's just as good, or for my testing, it is pretty much the same as Log3. Everyone thinks that Log3 is the ants pants and it is not. Wide dynamic range mode on all those cameras, including this one, I get the same result. So even if a subject is backlit, so here's a couple of examples of that. So this is wide dynamic range mode. The owl's looking really good. It's the uh, camera's done a really good job of showing us all the detail in the feathers, it's lit up properly. While the background, it's not blown out. There is detail there. It, it was a very harsh, overcast sort of day, reflective clouds in the sky. So it's held up really well. And if you compare it with this next one, which is log three, there's no difference between the two. They are identical. I'm seeing the wide dynamic range is the best for me. And that's why I've stuck with it for years. And we're going to have a look at some more footage and examples of uh, dynamic range and how awesome this camera is. So I have this log had a hot spot on it, tweak it a little bit and uh, make it look a lot better. Yeah, just brought the brightness down, a little bit of contrast extra just to help out, but there's no drama there, it's gone. The hot spot, there's lots of detail in there. And that's, that's the point, wide dynamic range mode. Even if you use the Log3, this camera keeps a lot of detail. These images here, a side lit, back lit, the whole range. We're getting great detail from the wide dynamic range that this camera has. So this last one is of me talking in harsh, harsh overhead light. It's really bad. So if I just tweak it a little bit, bring the brightness down, do a little bit of other magical things, we can bring it back to a respectable Exposure. Well, let's look at how I've set the camera up with the configuration of the buttons to work for me so that I can be quick and efficient. So the first one is the button at the front. I have that set for the waveform monitor. Now, we can set the waveform monitor up or down, but we can't move it back. So I find it it's in my eyesight. I don't want it there. It's too far over. I want it pushed over further. So, I prefer to have a look and then turn it off. The second one is focus peaking. So number 10 is my focus peaking. And if I want to quickly go over to slow motion, number 13, the rate button. That it's good, it's out of the way, it's over there, it's easy to remember. Now the wheels, I have assigned the front wheel at the top here to be my aperture wheel because Canon what are you doing 
oh, this is one of the things that really pissed me off with this camera when I first started playing with it. The wheel where we, on every other camera I have ever owned, DSLR, mirrorless, this wheel here is what turns, changes our f-stop, our aperture. It does nothing. <laughs> I can't assign it to anything. And that's where I'm used to going to find my aperture. So if I'm photographing, it's fine. It's working beautifully. But then muscle memory, you go back to filming and you go, oh, I don't know when I'll ever get used to that. I've reassigned, I can't remember what it was uh, just assigned to in a default mode, but I've put that back as my ISO. With stabilization, I'm getting some mixed results. So I can walk around handheld with a wide angled lens and it's not too much of a drama. So I can come up close to a subject and I can also hand zoom in as well and it can stay quite stable. But when I'm walking forward, all of a sudden, the focusing system goes absolutely nuts. It's just pulsing. So we'd have to go for manual focusing, I think, in that case. But when it comes to the zoom lens, so my RF 100 to 500 L lens, <laughs> the stabilization goes completely out of control. I've tried all sorts of things, even, Landing it on a branch didn't make any difference. It's uncontrollable, so it's uh, out of the picture as far as I'm concerned. So using my one, uh, what is it, 100 to 24 mil lens, which I'm using right now, works really well. Now the odd thing is, with the zoom lens, when I go to slow motion, <laughs> it completely changes. It's quite stable. So what's going on there, Canon? <laughs> Another quirky thing. Speaking of slow motion, I'm getting a similar result that I've gotten out of the R6. It's just slightly soft. So here's me running at the camera. See, it's just that slight bit of softness to it, but we're shooting in high resolution, 4K. I can use the MXF file, long up, uh, at 120 frames per second. So that is unbelievable to finally get to use in 4K rather than 1080p. So we're getting much more detail, we're getting good color information. It's, so this particular image, the blowfly looks really tack sharp and it's the best slow motion image that I've gotten so far. But when we pull back and have a look at the Agile Antikinus running up onto the same stage, it's got that slight softness about it. Yeah, the, the fur isn't as detailed. Well, I think we need to wrap up this video. My final thoughts, this camera with wide dynamic range mode and being able to film in any lighting conditions is just heaven sent. <laughs> no worries now when I go back to doing my documentary. I'm not gonna carry on about that. It's been a long drama, that one, but there's not going to be a worry when I feel real good about coming out and talking to the camera. Light isn't going to be an issue unless the shadow's under my eyes. <laughs> That's about it. But um, yeah, I think my favourite, absolute favourite thing about this camera is being able to film in low, low light. Forest environment, we get a mixed bag, but mostly we get really dark areas in the forest and my cameras in the past can only go to a certain limit, but this just keeps going. We have those dual base ISOs that really help us out as well. We're not talking about going into darkness, we're just talking about like a, a really heavily overcast day. It gives you confidence to be able to film noise free in really horrible lighting. Hope you enjoyed this video. And if you'd like to subscribe to my channel and get more of this amazing stuff, click on my pretty little face that's down in the bottom right hand corner of the screen. Hit the little bell, you'll get notification whenever I do anything else. If you wanna go and have a look at all the other mad and crazy things I've been doing in the past, click on my icon right here at the end of this video. Take it on my channel. I talk about photographing and filming in a forest environment, open environment. When I go on adventures, I always take you with me. And when I buy, keep knocking a camera, when I buy cameras and camera accessories, I do reviews on them and give you my honest opinion on them. 
So go and have a browse, there'll be something there of interest to you, I am sure. And always, always remember, if you don't do, you don't get. So get out there and start photographing and filming wildlife, and I'll catch you on the next one. Bye.